Yeah, good morning to Professor Bernie. Hello. Good morning. Yeah, Namaskar and uh, a good and good afternoon to all the participants joining from India. Uh, so just updating Professor Bernie, what has been done done today morning? So we have uh, just showed them Colab notebooks, uh, Python codes uh, where we have showed them FBGS attack and also CNW attack has also been demonstrated on a cat and dog problem. Mm -hmm. And the epsilon, the epsilon parameter has been changed, and different accuracies have been shown. So those notebooks have been run, and uh, and it is already sh shared on GitHub. So people can also download later after the workshop, and they also can use the, those parts on their own. Good. So this is the up update from of the attacks that have been carried out today. And uh, in I had some additional time, so I also told them about auto encoders and how it goes into denoising. And how it is a little bit difficult to attack an auto encoder. So those little bit of concept. Tomorrow we are going to show a few more attacks. Tomorrow is the last day, and we'll also show them GANs. So okay. how how a generator and a discriminator work in that setting. Mm -hmm. so that's the agenda. And I think the agenda for you today is with regard to finishing the uh, the attacks and uh, I think starting possible defenses. Yes, sure. Yeah. I have a question. With regard to, to the attacks, which version of full box are you using? Uh, the full box, the latest version, what is available from the mm -hmm. Geonos, uh, from that researcher. So three dot something. Yeah, yeah. Yes, because uh, I mean, I was just curious because the meaning uh, uh, of the parameters epsilon is different from the previous right. versions to this one. So yeah, just the curiosity. Okay. Right. So we have used only two attacks. We could only get time uh, about that time what we could do, but we have shown it on two uh, problems and uh, uh, participants have already also shown how it affects an inception network where it is a little bit difficult to attack and a plain vanilla CNN where it is easy to attack. So that has been shown to the participants. Okay, thank you. It's over to you, Dr. Sabani. So I can go, I think. Yeah, yeah. One moment, I stop this. Okay, so I share my screen. Uh, let me see. Uh, it's, uh, where is it? Oh, here. Go. Do you see the screen? Yeah, visible, visible. Okay, good. So we continue with the attacks because yesterday it took more time than uh, I thought, but since the defenses part will be a little bit shorter, there should be no problem to do everything today. So the remaining part of the attacks uh, is related to the attacks with the limited knowledge because we saw yesterday that uh, while attacks uh, in the digital domain with the perfect knowledge setting can be really powerful. And as we will see later today, defending against them is not easy at all. Carrying out an attack in a more practical situation is not the obvious. Yesterday, I considered the problems related to uh, the necessity and the needs regarding to attacks carried out in the physical domain or anyhow, attacks carried out on a uh, current, uh, I mean, how can I say, current uh, uh, image formats where the pixels must be uh, recorded in the integer format, in, in the integer domain. Today, I will consider the other big limitation of practical attacks, that is uh, when we have not a full knowledge about the, uh, the system that you want to attack, because this is usually the case. It's not very common that you can access all the internal parameters of the system that you're going to attack. Very often, these uh, models are accessible in uh, uh, a machine as a service framework where you can access the output and the input of the model through an API, but you cannot access the internal parameters and you cannot even apply back propagation. What can you do in these cases? Well, this is what I'm gonna talk about now. So the most common 
approach to deal with uh, a limited knowledge scenario is that the attacker builds a surrogate detector and then carry, carries out the attack on the surrogate detector and applies the attack to the target network, uh, trusting that the attack will be transferable. So the very basic concept, uh, making it possible an attack in limited knowledge setting is the transferability of the attack. Uh, whenever needed, in the following, I will indicate with phi hat the surrogate detector. The surrogate detector is a detector for which one or more between the network uh, parameters, the weights of the networks, and or the training data used to train the detector are not those of the target detector, but are just an estimate, an educated guess of the attacker with regard to the target network. So suppose I know that a certain system uses exception net to classify cats and dogs. Uh, if I do not have access to the model, what I can do is that I can train my own version of an exception net network trying to solve the same cats and dogs problem. But of course, when I do that, I will use a different uh, training set. And so the network that I will train will be different than the one I'm going to attack. But similar, because uh, the network architecture is the same. Okay? In that case, L is known perfectly, but the weights and the training data is not. And then there can be many other kinds of mismatch between uh, uh, the network I have, so the surrogate network and the target network. And, and the idea is that uh, in order to account for this mismatch, it is necessary that we carried out a little bit stronger attack. And an example of this, uh, some examples of, of this uh, are already given in the original paper by Paperno and the others regarding that first study, the transferability of the attack. Good. Uh, so just to make an example, suppose you have a network. This is the boundary of the detection region of the surrogate detector. So this is your sample that you want to attack. This is one class, CI. This is another class, CJ. And I do my best to bring this on the other side of the detection region. This would be the attack sample. You have seen uh, during your collab uh, experiments that very often the, the methods in full box, the attacks, uh, aim at attacking a sample with the minimum possible distortion. That is to go in the target class with the minimum possible distortion. If you do so, your sample is attacked for the surrogate detector, but then when you apply it to the, to the target network, what happens is that uh, the boundary of the, of the detection region may be a little bit different, possibly similar, so that the original sample is classified well, but it is possible that you have no guarantee that the attacked sample is still in region CJ for the target network. And in the example that I've just drawn here, you see that the red attack sample is a good attack for the blue surrogate network. But when it goes to the red targeted network, 
the attack is no more a good one. What can you do then? What you can do is to try to move the attack sample more inside the target region, like here. This introduces a larger distortion, a larger perturbation, but hopefully when you apply this attack the sample to the target network, this will still be inside the correct, the target region of the attack also for the target network, target model. So basically, all the methods trying to enforce the transferability of the attack uh, uh, works by applying a stronger attack and hope that these stronger attacks can transfer from the surrogate to the target network. Good. Uh, there, there have been several works trying to study the attack transferability in a multimedia forensic framework. And it turns out, even if there is no uh, really sound explanation or maybe more extensive uh, tests would be needed, but there is some consensus that transferability is more difficult to achieve in multimedia forensics applications. A possible explanation is that when you deal with computer vision, so you want to distinguish cats and dogs, well, it is reasonable to assume that all the networks rely on the same features. If the network has to be a good detector, a good classifier for cats and dogs, it's reasonable, it's reasonable to assume that all the networks will rely on the same features. They will look at the shape of the ears, they will, show, they will look at the mustache, they will look at the tail and so on and so forth. While even because, even because many of these computer vision applications derive from some basic uh, networks trained on, on the same data set. In most of the cases in computer vision applications, the networks you build are built starting from a pre-trained network uh, trained on the ImageNet data set. So in a sense, these networks are similar somewhat. They look at this as similar features. In multimedia forensics and other security applications, the traces the network looks at may be very different. So suppose you want to distinguish between gun generated images and natural images. It is possible that different networks look at completely different artifacts introduced by the gun. If this is the case, then attacking one network doesn't say much about what another network will do. So in principle, there is some consensus that transferability is more difficult to achieve in multimedia forensics applications. Here, I show some results reported in this paper of mine that we published three years ago, where we studied, the we carried out a very extensive study on the transferability of adversarial examples against CNN models dedicated to image forensics. This was published at ICASP three years ago. So we consider several cases of transferability. Here in this first slide, I report as an example, the result on cross-modal transferability. So what is the idea? We have two networks, different architectures, uh, trained to solve the same task. But, and this architecture have been trained on the same data set. Is it possible to transfer an attack from one network to the other? So what you see in this table, 
is that here you have the source network. So the network that has been used to implement the attack and the target network. And in parentheses, in brackets, you have the detection task. So here we consider resizing detection and medium filtering detection. Then we consider two networks architectures. Uh, these were popular architectures at the time we wrote the paper. Nowadays, uh, other architectures are used, but I mean, the meaning is the same. So we have this buyer stamp architecture and uh, an architecture developed by my group and published uh, one year before at ISIC. The first one has pre-processing, so high pass filtering. The second doesn't, so they are a little bit different. And then we consider two possible data sets, the raised 2K data sets of images and the vision data set. These are popular data sets for forensics applications. And so you see here what happens, for instance. And then we did this for different kinds of attacks. So in this case, we consider the IFGSM attack with different parameters and two Jacobian silence map attack, JSME attack with different parameters. Uh, what does happen? So I will just make a few examples. Consider we have a surrogate detector based on buyer networks. And then we want to transfer the attack to another network whose architecture is the GC1. The accuracy of the two networks without attacks is very good, 97 and 98. Then we apply the IFGSM attack or other attacks. The PSNR is very good. So the attack uh, is, is a good one because the image is not distorted almost at all. And the attack success rate on the source network is perfect. You are able to attack the source network almost always. But then when we transfer to the target network, the attack does not work at all. Then we try to move from, and to do the same on medium filtering, because possibly, the features the networks are looking for are similar. Then once again, the attack is very powerful, very good PSNR, powerful attack on the source network. And again, the accuracy on the target network is very bad one. But in one case, there is one special case where the attack can be transferred. But in most of the cases, cross-modal transferability is not achieved. Another example. In this case, we apply cross-training transferability. Now, the source and target networks have the same model, same task, but train on different data sets. So for instance, here you have the buyer stam network, trained on RISE and targeting the same network trained on vision data set. Many kinds of attacks. And then in the second part, we do the other way around. Train on vision and targeted a network trained on RISE. Again, the PSNR is very large. The attack success rate on the source network is very large, but when you go to the target network, in most of the cases, but these two, the attacker cannot be transferred. And the same, when we apply the same result to medium filtering. Once again, the success rate on the source is very large, but the success rate on the target is pretty poor. Eventually, we also carried out some cross-training and cross-modal transferability, where both the network and the training set change and results are very similar. Very good attack rate 
on the source network, but when it goes to the target, the, the, the success rate of the attack is more is almost zero. Just only one case, we good we got some decent result. Of course, this applies only on these two classes of attacks, uh, but some further experiments we carried out after this paper uh, confirmed that even with other kinds of attacks, if we don't pay any attention to the strength of the attack, that is, if we target a large PSNR, the attacks in general are not transferred. Good. So what can we do to improve transferability? Because without transferability, attacks in a limited knowledge scenario are not possible. Well, there have been several approaches to do this. I will uh, describe just two here. One is called input diversity. The other is called increased confidence. Uh, the first one was published in 2019 at CVPR. The last one we published is uh, at the conference in one year ago. And so the second one is from a group. The other is, is from another group. Uh, with, uh, with the input diversity, uh, we do something similar to the EOT uh, scenario, expected attack over different transformation. So we want to attack an image. We, we, pro, we, we, we study an attack that works not only for this specific image, but also for several slightly different images when we apply, for instance, geometric transformations. In this way, of course, the task is more difficult. We need a stronger attack. And since the attack is stronger, we tend to go more inside the target class of the attack. And hence, there are more chances that the attack is transferred. In the approach proposed by, by my group, uh, the, the, the solution is a bit different. So now you have, and uh, what we do usually, when we apply the gradient search, uh, both with one-step attacks like FGSM or iterated attacks like IFGSM or Carlinian Wagner, in all cases, usually the search, the gradient search stops as soon as you enter the target region. Well, what we can do is that we go on until the difference between the output of the network with respect to the target region and the, re and, and the second largest output is larger than a certain value C, a certain confidence value C. So suppose you have four nodes at the output, C1, C2, C3, C4. Suppose the original image is, what happens? The original image is classified as C1, but you want to target C3. You want that your attack, after the attack, the image is classified as C3. Uh, what we do is that we impose that the output of the network with respect to three or minus the second largest output is larger than a certain confidence C. Usually it's only needed that this is larger than zero. So making sure that your target class is the largest. Here we want that there is a certain gap between what you get, your target and the second largest. Well, this is not easy to, to do often because of one problem, because before 
the last layer of the network, you usually have a kind of soft max layer. Usually, before the last layer, you have a soft max. With a soft max, what happens is that even a small change before the soft max layer can result in saturated outputs. So carrying out the attack here may be difficult, even because you have a kind of a, a gradient vanishing problem. So our attack usually is applied at the logic level. So here you have the so-called logic Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. These logics then are often transformed into the outputs by applying something like E, Z, I, divide sum over I, E, Z, I, something like that, uh, G. So rather than applying the attack here at the output, we apply the attack at the logic level. So in practice, we require that the logic of the target network is sufficiently larger than the second largest logic. So the logic of the target output is larger than the others by a certain confidence C. Of course, if you increase the confidence C, your attack sample will go more inside the target region and hopefully the attack will be more transferable. The price we pay is that the attack introduces a larger distortion. So the perturbation increases and the PSNR decreases. Good. We carried out several experiments in this paper publishing 2021, and this is just an excerpt of the results we got. So here we have that I report some results on medium filtering detection. I mean, in the paper, there are many, many, many tables. I report only some of them uh, to let you have an idea of what's happening. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have uh, a cross-model mismatch because the source network is VGG net and the target network is Bayer Stam net. Both of them have been trained on RISE. So this is a kind of model mismatch. And then we apply this time uh, uh, more kinds of attacks, Carlin and Wagner, PGD, IFGSM, momentum improved IFGSM and input diversity. For the first four columns, we applied the increased confidence attack because this idea of increasing the confidence attack can be applied to any possible attack. So here you see C starts from zero and increases the confidence. What, what happens then? The PSNR decreases. When C is equal to zero, you are able to implement an attack with a very, very strong PSNR, 58, 70, 67, 69, but when you, the, the attack success rate on the source network is always 100%. But when you try to measure the success rate on the target network, what happens is that if the confidence is small, the success rate on the target network is very, very low, almost zero. But when the confidence increases, the PSNR decreases and you get almost perfect transferability. You see here. Something similar happens with the input diversity. 
The number of iterations here is a way to enforce diversity or more inputs and to enforce more diversity. So when the number of iterations increases, the PSNR decreases, but the success rate on the target network increases up to 86%. So you see, uh, attacks in a limited knowledge scenario are not impossible. You only need to increase the strength of your attack, passing from very high PSNR to smaller PSNR. Again, here, this is another example. It is uh, another kind of model mismatch. Training set is the same. And once again, the value of C here must change completely because the range of the logics changes from, not, from one network to the other. So it's not possible to give an absolute uh, interpretation of C. Nevertheless, you see that when C is zero, wow, the PSNR is absolutely huge. But when the confidence increases, the PSNR decreases, it goes in the 40s, but the success rate on the mismatched network increases. It was almost zero, it goes above 80% with an increased confidence. Similarly, for the input diversity, with one iteration, one iteration is already enough to improve the transferability, which is perfect when you get five iterations, but the PSNR is 40 dBs now. Similar results for resizing. Uh, I will go fast here. C0, no transferability. C, bigger, transferability increases. Not that much in this case. It turns out that achieving transferability on resizing for these two networks is more difficult. Even when the PSNR is as low as 30 or 10, 28, the transferability is limited to about 64, 52, 51, 52, and here, 51. Uh, another kind of transferability between other networks, uh, similar results, uh, this time transferability is a little bit better because with the PSNR around 30, you already get 80, 80, 80, and here, 100. Final results on cross network and training. Now we change both the network and the training data set. This is the most difficult case of transferability. And uh, well, nothing basically changes. If you decrease the PSNR down to 40s, then a good transferability can be get above 80 and sometimes even in the range of 100. So the basic way, the only way I would say to deal with a limited knowledge scenario is trying to enforce transferability of the attacks. Here, in general, transferability is obtained by increasing the strength of the attack, so decreasing the PSNR. And there are many ways of doing that. I presented two here, one based on confidence, another based on input diversity, another one is based on momentum, and then there may be many others. If you look at the state of the art, there are many papers published trying to improve the transferability of the attack. Exactly because this is a necessary condition if you want to carry out the attack in a real world setting where a perfect knowledge is not achievable. So in summary, and this was the end of the attack part of my uh, tutorial. So you have to say, you have to recognize that uh, adversarial examples are ubiquitous. And they raises the, the presence 
the unavoidable existence of the adversarial examples uh, raises interesting questions about the general behavior of DNNs, as I said yesterday, and most of all regarding the use of these architectures in security applications. As I will show today, devising good defense, defenses under strong threat models, that is, when the attacker has a full knowledge, and if the attacker can work in the digital domain, can be extremely difficult. As of now, no really working defense against attack in the perfect knowledge scenario in the digital domain has been developed. Uh, yet, I mean, carrying out an attack in a practical setting is not obvious. And in any case, I will look some possible defenses, not tomorrow, but now, because these uh, slides were thought to be uh, presented yesterday. So this concludes my part on the attacks. It was this uh, half an hour left from yesterday's uh, lecture. And then uh, this, this finishes. So if you have questions on the attacks, uh, I'm here to ask, even based on what we did in the collab a session this morning. Yeah. Uh, if there are any questions, participants can kindly ask by unmuting, or you could also put it in the chat box. Professor Barney. Yes, I just I was I'm thinking that so this transferability is possible and it may be cause of attack means due to that attacks possible. So mm -hmm. then 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 it is possible to do this attack whenever we perform uh, transfer learning, especially in the deep learning scenario. Okay, so transfer learning. Uh, I mean the task of the network should be the same. So if I don't know, if I have a network to classify cats and dogs, and, and then I use transfer learning to classify the no birds and fishes, then I mean attacking a dog and become a cat and then feeding the dog to the other network that just classifies uh, birds and fishes does not make much sense. So at least the task of the networks must be the same. Okay. When this is the case, so for instance, suppose you have a network to classify cats and dogs, and then I fine tune it on a better data set. So to consider even other kinds of cats and dogs, or classify cats and dogs in more, uh, I mean, wide conditions, then, uh, I mean, this could be a good uh, approach. I mean, try to attack a network after that the network has been fine-tuned, but I do not have the fine-tuned network. So I attack the original and try to enforce transferability. Okay. So that can be. Okay. But the task must be the key. Yes. Thank you. We have others. Other questions? No. So uh, now it's, it's time to go to the next uh, here, which is about the fences. So we talk about the fences now. But okay. What is that? But if you don't mind, I go. To take a, a glass of water because I have to have to drink one more. So I'll be back in two minutes. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure.
Okay, so I'm here. Okay, good. So, so let us look at the fences. Uh, I think, uh, okay, sure. So let, let us look at the fences against possible attacks. Again, I will start exactly with the same motto that I used for the attacker. Even in this case, knowledge is important. That's why in the end of today's lecture, I will go back to the, to the game theory. But for the moment, we are just wearing the hat of the, of the defender. So for the defender, knowing about the adversary is again very important. Knowledge is again a weapon. And this is one of the best weapons you may have for your battle. And so, uh, before trying to develop a defense, you should say, what do I know about the attack? In a game theoretic sense, this means that now the attacker plays first. I, I want to develop a system. I know the kind of attack that the attacker will try to apply. And then I will try to defend against this attack. When we are in this kind of scenario, and so when the defender knows about the attack, we talk about adversary aware defenses or adversary aware detectors. Because I can build a detector that is defending exactly against a certain attack. How do this work usually? There are two possibilities. One is to look for the traces left by the attack, and then I detect against the attack. So this is called, this is the paradigm that is called attack, then defend, uh, sorry, detect, then defend. Because not all post, not, not all the input images I will have to analyze have been attacked by an adversarial example. Likely a few of them will. So first, I want to detect if an attack is ongoing. And if I find that an attack is ongoing, I'll try to defend. The other possibility is to carry out adversary-aware training. In adversary-aware training, I don't care about detecting attacks, but I develop, I train a network, a model, that works even if there is an attack in it. I can do this if I know how the attacker works. So the, 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 the most common approach is uh, 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 to build a new detector that has been trained also on attack the same. Uh, so, the most common approach when you know about the attack is to retrain a machine learning detector. So what you do is what you see in this uh, equation. You retrain your detector with the same architecture, new weights, of course, and now the training set is the union of a, pre, of, of a training set with pristine non-attack samples and an adversary training set where we have attacked samples. So suppose you want to carry out, want to implement a classifier to distinguish cats and dogs. You train your exception net, but then you know that the attacker may attack your network. So you implement yourself the attack and get some image samples attacked with the, the no Carlini and Wagner, or maybe even a pool, an entire pool of attacks. Then you fine tune your model by introducing within the training set also some attack the same. This is called adversary, adversarial training.
And this works. It works extremely well. It is, it is a fact that if you train your network with attacked images as well, then your network will work very well also against attacked images. Wow, are we done then? No, we are not done. The idea is that with this adversarial training, we are exploiting the fact that we know everything about the attacker. And so in practice, we play second. And in the end, what we do is that we exit the perfect knowledge scenario, disinforming the attacker. What happens in fact? I have a certain F. I assume that the attacker attacks F with the perfect knowledge, but then I build a new detector, which is the adversarial trained, adversary aware detector. And this attack carried out on F does not work when it is applied on the adversarial detector. So in the end, the main trick, the main idea between, be, behind adversarial retraining is that I induce a mismatch between the attack of the system and the system I'm using. This is possible if I am the last player to play. This is possible and works because in this way, I force the attacker to pass from a perfect knowledge scenario to a limited knowledge scenario where the attacker does not know that I will use an adversarial trained detector. And of course, now you know it, you could go on and say, but what about if the attacker knows that I'm using an adversarial train detector. What does happen if the attacker now attacks this adversarial train detector? The attack works. This adversarial train detector is not more difficult to attack than the original one. If I know it as an attacker, I can attack this so if now the attacker has a perfect knowledge of this adversarial detector, the attacker can apply Carlinian Wagner or any other kinds of attack to this adversarial train detector and the attack will work perfectly. Then you could say, well, then I can retrain once again another double uh, trained detector that also introduces examples obtained by attacking the first step. And then you can see that immediately you go on the counter mouse loop, you continue patching your network. And then if there is a new attack, this new attack will work. You could say, if I go on iteratively, for a long time, building a new detector, attacking it, adversarial retrain, re-attack the adversarial retrain. If I go on like this for many loops, will I converge to a difficult to attack model? No. As at the time I'm speaking, so as of now, there's no evidence that iterating the attack, then retrain, then reattack a loop converges to a more secure system. Even after five, six, 10 iterations, what you get is still easily, easily attackable by one of the classical attacks. So this adversarial retraining works and works well only if the attacker has a perfect knowledge, sorry, if the defender has a perfect knowledge and hence 
the attacker does not have a perfect knowledge. This works only because it is just a way to enforce a limited knowledge scenario to the defender, to the attacker. If you can do it, this is perfect. This is a good defense. But this is not a defense against an attacker with perfect knowledge. Is this clear? Uh, uh, yes, Professor Bhatni, I have just yeah. one question. So will it not lead towards the overfitting? Uh, too in much a too sense, much. in a sense, OK, this depends on how you retrain. If you retrain only on uh, attacked examples, then very likely we will overfit. When you retrain, you need to be careful and retrain or fine tune on a good mixture of uh, adversarial examples and uh, pristine original images. Otherwise, you risk to overfit. Oh, so we have to make the balance that training data adversarial as well as the actual one. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Okay, yes. sure. Okay. Need to balance that. Yes. Thank you. So, as I told you, this retraining is a way to escape the full knowledge scenario. So, there are other ways of doing this. And retraining is not the only one. One possibility is security by obscurity. <laughs> as usually, I can try to simply hide to the attacker what network I'm using. Well, this is difficult because you know from security applications and from cryptography in the first place, that uh, is always difficult to completely hide your network, your system. Maybe what you could do, and this is another approach that uh, has been proposed by several researchers, including my group, you could try to use randomization. You could try to randomize your classifier so that the attacker knows everything about your classifier, but the particular randomization you are using. And this is a, a paper that uh, in my group uh, we wrote um, two or three years ago about this approach. This is only one of the possible approach, approaches using randomization. So the idea is that, the basic idea is that to include a source of randomness into the detector. And then this randomness will work like a secret key. And there are many ways of doing this. One possibility, for instance, is to randomize the decision boundary. I include some randomization in the way I make a decision. Another possibility, which is the one I will discuss a little bit more in details now because this is the work we have carried out in my group, is to randomize the choice of the features. Uh, but, but, but let me explain what I mean here. Eh? Because randomization may work, but once again, is a trick to escape the full knowledge scenario. Because this randomization is not implemented at test time, at the training time. So this is the idea. When I train my data set, I can train several versions DNN Q1, DNN Q2, DNN Q, I don't know, M. So I'm training M different versions of my DNN. So I have a pool of them. And then when I have a new sample to be classified, I choose one of them at random so that the attacker does not know exactly which of these networks I will use for my classification. Uh, good. And, and, and these networks are 
similar in a sense because they all share the same architecture. They maybe share the same training data, but there is some difference. There, there are some differences among them and these differences depend on a secret key generated at random in such a way that it's difficult for the attacker to know which key I used. This works as I will show later, but once again, it works because the attacker cannot work in a full knowledge scenario because the attacker does not know which of these networks he should attack. Maybe he attacks the last and then I use the first. If this happens, well, is again a problem of transferability. So even this idea of randomizing the network uh, enforces the attacker to look for a transferable attack. That is an attack that can transfer from different networks trained with different secret keys. Good. Well, if you can do this, as I will show, this kind of defense works pretty well unless the attacker uses very strong transferability measures. So uh, the problem here is not impeding a full knowledge attack, but trying to make transferability difficult. And, and I will show an example of this approach, uh, relying, I mean, describing very briefly, because otherwise there is too much mathematics, this paper here. This is, so suppose we use a classical uh, machine learning tool, for instance, an SVN. Huh? Then I will tell you a few things about how you can transfer this to deep learning. <laughs> but to understand what's happening, this is the best case. So suppose that this SVM relies on two features, F1 and F2. Well, these are the two classes, the red and the blue class. And if you have uh, an SVM with a linear decision boundary, like uh, a Fisher linear discriminant, then this, uh, this green uh, uh, boundary is the optimum decision boundary between these two. I train my SVM and came out with this decision boundary. Good. Then if the attacker knows everything, he can apply the best possible attack in the feature domain. In this case, we are assuming that the attack works in the feature domain and can bring this blue sample into the closest red sample and to the closest point of the red class. But suppose now that they use only one feature. The attacker knows that I'm using F1 and F2. But suppose now that I implement a detector that relies only on F1. This is what I have in the, here in the middle. I make my distinction based on the projection of the points on the F1 axis. And then the decision boundary will become this one. Because I only look at the X dimension. And now you see that the attacks obtain by considering a detector based on two features does not work when I use one feature only. This could seem strange because I attacked a more powerful detector, a detector based on two features. But this does not work when I implement a detector based on one feature only, or at least it depends on the feature. Because if I'm using F2 in this simple case, then the attack samples is again in the 
red region, and then the attacker works. But this is to give you an idea that if I attack a detector based on the full feature set, there's no guarantee that this will work also when I implement a detector based on a subset of the features. So the approach used in this paper is exactly this. I suppose they have a very large set of features. Say 1000 features. And then I build a detector based on a random subset of K features. If the attacker does not know the subset of the features, he can attack the full feature detector, but there is no guarantee that this will work. The attacker could, could also try to attack uh, uh, with an expectation over transformation method, a pool of K detectors based on K random features. But since it does not know the keys, the attacker can attack a detector based on K sub features, but he will never know the exact subset I'm using. So even in this case, there can be a mismatch that results in a failure of the attack. This is easy to understand when you have features and a classical SVM model, the same can be applied to deep learning. With deep learning, I will make a plot here. With deep learning, what you can do is the following. You train a, a, a CNN architecture where you have the convolutional layers And here you have the feature space. Train during training. And then usually have one or more fully convolutional layers. In this approach, what you do is that you train the convolutional layers then you fix the convolutional layers, extract a random subset of the features. So these, 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 and that, and retrain the full convolutional layer. This is the same approach where you randomize the choice of the features. Could also be seen as a dropout, but carried out at a much, much stronger level. So once again, the attacker can attack end to end the entire model with all the features or a model with K sub features, but he will never know the exact subset of features I'm using, even because the number of features usually is very large, say 1,000. If I choose the know 300 features out of 1,000, the number of possible ways I can choose 300 features out of 1,000 is a combinatoric number, which is really huge. It's impossible for the attacker to guess which features I'm using. So the attacker has only limited knowledge of what I'm doing. And then uh, we hope that transferability does not apply here, or at least does not apply easily. In this paper, uh, here, I, I don't go through the math here. Uh, nevertheless, in, in that paper, we analyzed the performance of this randomized feature detector when we use an optimum detector, we have two classes, trying to distinguish two classes, 
uh, characterized by a normal Gaussian distribution with uh, possibly different variances, but in the following, we will assume that the covariance of matrices are equal and different mean vectors. So it is like saying that I have two classes, opposite means and covariance matrix like this. Good. Well, in this case, we use this uh, model in our paper because in this case, we can carry out a closed form analysis of what happens with the random feature selection. And uh, we can get good insights indeed. So this is the model. The optimum detector is known from optimum decision detection theory. And the performance depends on this particular I mean, distance. Basically, it depends on the distance between the use between the use weighted by the covariance matrix. When you apply randomization, basically what you do is that we take the feature vector V and we apply a random choice S. S is a random choice matrix that uh, has only one one in each row. One. And when this is applied to V, the number of rows is less than the number of columns. When we apply this to V, we are choosing a subset of the features VR. Then if we do this, the two classes will have a, still a Gaussian distribution with the new mean value, which is the reduced set of mean values and with the covariance matrix, which is a reduction of the initial covariance matrix. And we can compute the performance. And this is important because if the set of features we are using is too small, maybe the performance, even in the absence of attacks, is not good. So we cannot choose just one feature. We cannot pass from 1,000 features to one feature. Otherwise, the classifier will not work anymore. Good. And then still in the paper, we can compute the performance when we implement an optimum attack against the full feature detector and we apply the attack to the reduced feature detector. Is a kind of theoretical study of transferability here. And then there is some uh, math. Everything depends on these parameters, don't care. But once we have this in closed form, we can carry out numerical analysis to see the performance of a system like this in, in the all Gaussian setup. And these are some plots that we get. Suppose your features are IID, so the covariance matrix is the identity possibly with different variances. Then what does happen? Mm, this defense works up to a certain point. What do you see here? We started with 300 features. So you have a normal distribution with 300 sim features. You have a vector with 300 independent Gaussian random values. And then we choose a subset K, 300, 200, 100, up to one feature only. And what you have on the vertical axis, red line, you have the error probability without attacks. So if you use 300 features, perfect detection. 200 features, perfect detection. 150, perfect detection. Hmm. When you start decreasing the number of features less than 100, the detector starts working a little bit worse. And when you get one feature only, in the end, the detector does not work anymore. So this red line tells you how many features, how much you can reduce the set of features. The blue line instead give you 
yes, give you the performance of the system after the attack. When you attack the full feature and you test on the reduced features, averaged over many possible choices of the random key. So what happens is that if you use 300 and you attack 300, of course, the error probability is equal to one because the attack will work. But when the number of features decreases, the mismatch between the attacked features and the features you're using increases and the error rate decreases. The error rate decreases. This means that the attack success rate lowers, but not much indeed. So suppose you, you stay up with 150 features. The attack success rate passes from 100 to about 75%, which is good, but uh, not that good. And this is for a certain strength alpha of the attack. If I increase the strength, the idea is that I enforce a larger distortion and I'm trying to enforce more transferability. And in the, in the right diagram, you see that when, if the attack strength increases, it goes to two, this one parameter, then the attack continues to be effective even when K is small. So these results are not very good, but they refer to IID features. In real life, these features are never IID. So we carried out, so when Sigma is the identity matrix. It turns out that when Sigma is not the identity matrix, this defense, like in most real life applications, this defense is much better. And you see it here. And you see now that the red plot is the same, of course, nothing changes. But the blue plot changes a lot because now, as soon as there is a certain mismatch between the full feature set used by the attacker and the number of features used by the defender, then the accuracy of the attack, the attack success rate decreases a lot. So for instance, if I use 250 random features out of 300, the accuracy of the system is still very good, red line, but the blue line is already very low with an attack success rate, which is around 0.05. If I increase the strength of the attack, things go a little bit better for the attacker, but still not much. If I focus on this, uh, the node 200, the performance of the attack is slightly above 10%, 11, 12%. So indeed, uh, and, and uh, it's interesting, in the paper, there is also a nice interpretation as to why using dependent features is better for the attack, uh, for the defender. But I will leave this in the paper. So this is very interesting and it shows that this could work. There is also a very nice interpretation of this. Uh, the idea is that this is the attack. It's complicated, but I mean, I will just say the important part. This is the attack implemented on the full feature detector. Uh, you can split this attack in two parts. Uh, where is that? This part, and if you see this part, no, no, one moment. Uh, you have to split. Uh, you have to split this. Uh, uh, norm in two parts. Uh, this norm can be split in two parts because this is a square norm. So this can be split into the norm times the norm. Okay, now 
If you do this, you see that there is this part, which is a vector, divided by the norm of the vector. This is a versor whose magnitude is equal to one, this part. So this part here will tell you the direction of the attack in the feature space. While this part is a scalar number that will tell you the strength of the attack. Good. So with the optimum attack, both the strength and the direction of the attack are computed on the full feature detector. Well, it turns out that when you go to reduce feature detector, both the direction and the strength are no more optimal. And you can see it very easily here. Because in this case, for instance, you, you, you set this strength and this direction based on this. If I had used this other, then both the direction and the strength should be different. If I insist going to this direction, then I should go a little bit farther. Or I should change direction and go in this other direction. So it's interesting because this randomization enforces a strength and the direction mismatch. And here you have also the proof of this. And in these plots, you have the angle between the optimum attack carried out in the full feature case and the attack carried out and the optimum attack that you should carry out in case you know the features. And you see that when K is equal to 250, there is a mismatch whose average is about 50 degrees. If K decreases, it increases. And for instance, in this case, when uh, K is equal to 50, the angle, mis the, the angle between the optimum direction and the direction you use is about 75, 80. And if you have an optimum direction and you go in the wrong direction, and this is theta, well, the really effective part will be the size, the strength, so the norm, so call it delta times cosine theta. And if theta is close to 90 degrees, then your attack is not effective at all. So this is a very nice insight. When you apply randomization or when you apply any kind of limited knowledge scenario, there are two efforts, a strength and the direction mismatch. And the direction mismatch is the one that really counts. And I'll make another example here. I used this picture before. Now what is blue? This is your sample, and the blue is your surrogate detector, which in the in the random feature selection is uh, the detector based on the full feature set. And I said, suppose you go here as an attack. The example I gave before is the following: when you go to the real to the target model and the boundary changes and going across the blue boundary is not enough. 
I should have gone a little bit farther. This is the kind of strength mismatch. To recover from this, you only need to implement a stronger attack to improve transferability. But there is a more subtle and more dangerous effect in, in, in induced by randomization and this stuff. If the boundary changes direction, or maybe even worse, If the boundary of the target is like this, then uh, the problem is that the attack should go this way. If I insist going this direction, maybe I will never, uh, I will never cross the boundary. This is a kind of angle mismatch. You may think that this kind of change is too dramatic. Well, in two dimension it is, but in 1000, 2000 direction at dimensions, in high dimensional spaces, the number of possible directions is so large that the angle mismatch is easy to get. And so the problem is that I compute my gradient on the surrogate detector, but then the, the gradient of the target detector is completely different. Then I'm trying in, in a sense to fool your detector. You go in one direction, your attack, you go in one direction, but the good direction will be another one. This is what is enforced by this randomized uh, feature selection. And in the essence, is what is informed, is enforced very often when you try to force the attacker to work in a limited knowledge scenario. Good, then in, in, in this paper, we also shown some results with practical attacks. Hmm? So we apply this to an SVM based detector, trying to detect adaptive histogram equalization and medium filtering and you carried out the attack both in the feature and the pixel domain. And here we have some results. Okay, don't care about this. We apply the attack. Uh, what attack did you apply? Oh, no, this is an attack for SVM. So these are the attack images, doesn't count too much. And these are the results we got. Eh? We start with 750 features. The accuracy remains very good until we work only 10 features. So see, these are very good features. And the blue, orange, and green curve is the attack success rate when the attacker attacks the full feature detector, but they use less features. You see that the attack success rate decreases down to about uh, 40, 50% when I use only 10 features. Uh, the orange, blue, and, and green, and gray refers to different strength of the attack. So the, the gray is when the attacker is stronger and so on and so forth. Here I have another example, this time for medium filtering detection, and the results are similar. If you go to using about 10 features, the the, the accuracy of the attack goes down in the range of 30% or so. Think about that this gray line refers to very strong attacks. Could we improve this from an attacker point of view? Yes. Is a problem of improving the transferability because this defense in the end relies on lack of transferability. Whenever 
go to the very beginning. Whenever the knowledge gain is won by the defender, then the defender will force the attacker to work in a limited knowledge scenario. So everything boils down to transferability. The defender does its best to make the attack non-transferable, while the attacker will have to do its best to improve the transferability. This is when uh, you... Uh, Prof Professor Bernie. Please, please. Question, go, go. Yes, yes, yes. Just I was thinking, you said that if angle mismatch is more, then mm -hmm. it, uh, that is more in the higher dimension, yes? Then is? Angle mismatch is more in higher dimension, in higher dimension. Yes, yes, because you have many more directions to choose, to choose from, yes, absolutely. So in that case, attackers, are go, may not able to attack. Well, it's more difficult. Yes, you you, you need to you need to apply. I mean, getting transferability is more difficult. So, so you in, need to in to higher a stronger, and stronger attack. But so in higher dimension, it means attacks are less possible. Yes, more difficult. Uh, but but we are yes, trying. Yes, sure, sure. But we because, are because trying. But we are drawing that in the less dimension features, attacks are very difficult. So slightly, I, I'm getting contradiction. No, 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 no. So, so the idea is that, I mean, if you use few features okay. in a large set of features, mm -hmm. the attack is more difficult because it is more difficult for the attacker to know which your features are in the essence. Okay. But you cannot use too many. If you use too many, your detector will be wrong. And you cannot use one feature only. Otherwise, okay. your detector will be wrong. But suppose you have 1,000 features. Mm. If you use 200, mm. 200 features is still a very large dimension. Yes. And guessing which 200 features you're using out of 1,000 is absolutely Impossible. Difficult. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I had one question here. Uh, it's 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 just an overthought. Uh, since we are uh, the the uh, the objective here is from the defender's point of view, uh, going in towards randomization. So mm -hmm. on the contrary, if we think from an attacker's point of view, since we are searching for a meaningful direction, so can't there be an eigen I mean uh, means can't this be thought as an eigenvalue problem where we find out where exactly is the maximum scatter? So a principal component analysis will also work from the attacker's point of view. Absolutely, absolutely. This is very interesting. Indeed, you are working on, on a paper in this period, it's not ready for submission, but we're almost there, where, I mean, of course, we, we go on with, with, with a kind of never-ending loop again, but I mean, suppose the attacker knows that I'm using this random feature stuff. Yeah. Then what could the attacker do? In the plots that I've shown, I've shown a case where the attacker simply attacked the full feature detector. Yeah. And uh, this doesn't work much. Then the attacker could try to attack a random set of K features at random. And this will not work either. Uh, the attacker could try to attack uh, the average of, uh, I mean, it, it could come out with 10, 12 or 20 subset of features and attack uh, the average of those. We tested and this uh, doesn't work much, but as you said, you could try to attack the best features. So apply PCA and attacks the best possible features. This works a little bit better, not perfectly, but at least according to the experiments we are running in this period, this works a little bit better, yes. Not perfect, but still it works a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so, so the answer would be from, uh, because if I go and think about being an intelligent attacker, so I would always 
because there are a subset i have to choose within 1000 so my mm. uh, thing says that i'll apply a pca and then try to find out the best eigen direction and sure, then sure. And, and go there yes yeah Absolutely. Yes. okay yeah okay so you, you will be your surrogate detector by using right. the, the 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 subset of the best possible features and then right. you attack that this is so, possibly the best the attacker can do so so it on, on a lighter note it would be uh, attack is the best form of defense <laughs> ah you as always as always you you need to be a good thief to be a good agent okay thank you i mean once again the, the, this is the 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 knowledge arms race I and mean, who knows more about the other so you, you have to try to impersonate the other to understand what the other could do and then you easily get into game theory <laughs> But then what? Suppose you lose this uh, arms race, because if you don't lose the arm race, then uh, there is something you can do. But suppose you lose the arm race. Huh? In the end, suppose you want to carry out a defense in the worst case, when the attacker has full knowledge. Is it possible to defend a full knowledge attack so that you do your move and then the attacker does its best. This is a game, a kind of game. Uh, this is a game where the attacker plays second. So the attacker has an advantage, but you know that the attacker is there. So among all possible strategies, you will choose the one that makes the life of the attacker more difficult. It's a kind of worst case. Since the attacker will choose the strategy to make the worst damage, then you choose the strategy for which the worst damage is minimum. So it's a kind of min-max, if you could enlist all possible strategies. Out of the game theoretic uh, analogy, what I say here is that if you lose this arms race, try to build a big wall. This can always help. So you try to make the life of the attacker more difficult. Even if, as we will see in the end, uh, the attacker has uh, a gain in the full knowledge case. Nevertheless, you can try to build those that are called intrinsically more secure detectors. So that is detectors that by their nature are more difficult to attack, even if the attack knows everything. And there are several approaches to do that, several approaches proposed. All of them have been defeated, more or less. But at least you're making the attacker's life more difficult. Meaning that, for instance, the attacker must introduce a larger distortion, a larger perturbation before attacking your system. Or maybe uh, coming out with a good attack requires more computing power or things like that, good. And here we'll describe a few possible strategies to make the life of the attackers more difficult. I will just go uh, through them uh, with, a, with a bird eye view. I mean, I will not go into the very fine details of all of them, but I will just give an overview of what you could try to do. So I, I do a little bit of this, then we make a break. Eh? Otherwise this turns out to be too heavy for you. So one first possibility, for instance, um, described here is to impede the gradient analysis. Because we have seen that mo most of these attacks are based on gradient computation. Most of these attacks that we have implemented in, in the full box and that you have tried this morning rely on computing the gradient of the network and then, and then applying a kind of gradient descent attack. So some of the attacks try to introduce a non-differentiable step into the system, something for which the gradient cannot be computed. And two possibilities are shown here. 
the first paper, okay, I suggest these two papers. The first one is a nice paper proposing a defense. The second one is, is, a, is a must read paper. If you're interested in this topic, of course, where these three authors, including Carlin and Wagner, analyzed a large set of possible defenses developed until that time, uh, 2018. And for each of them, they propose a counter attack. And in most of the cases, the counter, I mean, counter, counter attack works. But it's very interesting because in this paper, they uh, analyze a larger number of possible defenses. And so it's also a very nice overview about defenses. Nevertheless, one possibility is to introduce a non differential step. The easiest way is to apply quantization. If you quantize the input image, for instance, well, Quantization is something like this and cannot be uh, differentiated because the gradient in zero is zero in many areas. Then it jumps here, the gradient does not exist and then it's again zero. So basically is suppose you want to implement your attack in the floating point domain. So, and focus on one pixel values. Suppose one pixel value F, uh, sorry. The pixel values I, I, J is equal to 0 0.796. But suppose that the first thing you do before inputting this image to the network, you quantize I. We quantization step, which is the no zero one. So zero, this zero six nine seven nine six will become so say zero two will become zero nine because I'm probably rounding. Then the input to the network is zero nine. If as an attacker I try applying gradient to this. And I modify this 097 a little bit. So maybe I move to 08, 078, or 081. After quantization, I will always end up in 09. So the gradient is zero basically here. And then all of a sudden, when this becomes zero, I don't know, uh, 69, this goes down to 05. Or zero seven, you know, something like that. So if you do this, the quantization enforces a zero gradient, and then you cannot apply gradient descent. And this works if the attacker does not know that. There have been two proposals in this sense. One is quantizing directly the pixels, like when we transform these to the integers. Another one is to apply JPEG compression. JPEG compression is applies quantization in the frequency domain, and hence uh, it is also much stronger. Well, if we apply this defense against attacks that are not thought to work in this case, then uh, these defenses are okay. If you look at this paper, uh, Standard attacks do not work anymore. But once again, if you apply an attack that does not take into account the presence of this non differentiable step, then uh, you're not playing a perfect knowledge attack. If you know that this exists, then your life as an attacker is more difficult because you cannot apply gradient descent as is. Still, Carlin and Wagner has proposed a new attack called the uh, backward pass differential approximation that still works in this case. I will tell you, so I'm speaking about defenses, but I also say something about attacks because you have to say attacks against defenses.
How does this work? Basically, suppose Fi is the non-differentiable, the non-differentiable step in your network. Could be a layer, could be the input. Then the attacker that knows everything, because you are in the perfect knowledge scenario, the attacker can come out with a differentiable approximation of Fi. In the, in, the, in the easiest case, since Fi cannot destroy the image too much, G could also be the identity. The non-differentiable step cannot be too far from the identity. Otherwise, it changes the image too much. Then what we do is that in the backward pass, we apply the approximation because we need to know, uh, because I mean, in iterated attacks, you have to perform several forward and backward passes. So you have your image, you compute the gradient and you apply the gradient step. Then you go forward, recompute the gradient for this new image and apply another step. So you have a number of forward and back steps. The idea is that you use the non-differentiable true layer for the forward pass, but in the backward pass, you use the differentiable approximation to compute the gradient. Of course, this is more difficult. It requires some more work, but if you do this, the attack still works as it is explained carefully in this paper. So what? So, so what we did in the end? What we did is that we made the life of the attackers more difficult. So we tried to build a big wall, but still in the perfect knowledge case, the attack is still possible. Uh, let me see. Okay, I mean, uh, it is more than one hour and a half. So I could make the break now. Uh, what do you think? I think it's good to make this 15 minutes break now. Yeah, sure. Right? I think we Otherwise, it's, 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 it's too tiring. Huh? So we yeah. go back at 11.30, more or less. Yeah. Okay. But if you have questions before the break, no, no, about this, this uh, gradient non-differentiable step or backward pass differentiable approximation. No, oh, then we, we, we make a brief break. Good? Yeah.
שלום. Yeah, we are ready to go. Can we go? Okay, good. So I will go through other possible defenses. One uh, that's interesting is to, to use uh, again or other means for denoising. Because once again, denoising can be seen as a way to remove the perturbation introduced by the attack before feeding the image to the network. Because this perturbation can be seen indeed as a kind of noise. So if I have a denoising method, if I apply denoising prior to feeding the CNN with this image, then the perturbation is possibly removed. So any kind of denoising can be used for this purpose. And if you look at this in the end, this is a kind of, uh, is again a way to introduce a vanishing gradient phenomenon. Because if you have your image, you modify a little bit it with a perturbation, and then your denoising removes this perturbation, it means that the, uh, the effect of a small change on the final output will be minimum, uh, possibly zero. And so in this way, you are nullifying the gradient uh, of your system with respect to the perturbation. And this means that you are using a vanishing gradient approach to uh, defend against the attack. And once again, uh, you can use uh, uh, as counter counter attacks these uh, uh, BDPA and, and, and this other stuff. Nevertheless, uh, even with this approach, you make the life of the attacker more difficult. And, uh, and we'll present in particular one very nice method based on GAN for the noising. And this is the system, I think, is this one. And this is a very popular method. And even according to Carlini and Wagner, this is one of the more difficult uh, uh, defenses to cope with uh, by the attack. It's not perfect, but even Carlini and Wagner, the success rate of the attack uh, uh, decreases by 50%, more or less. So how does this work? This is the idea. Suppose you train a gun, so suppose your classifier takes this input image from a certain domain. No, no, cats and dogs. And let's just use all the same example. And suppose you, you train a gun to produce images in the input domain of the CNN, that is cats and dogs. And suppose you train a gun on clean samples without the attack. The basic assumption here is that this gun, since it has been trained on clean examples only, the basic assumption is that every image produced by the gun will not contain adversarial examples. Basically, the manifold with the images produced by the gun does not include adversarial examples. So, when you have an image X to be, how can I say, to be uh, classified by your classifier, you do the following. You, you generate several random numbers that then are input to the generator of the GAN. And you apply the GAN to all these input numbers to input random numbers. And then what you do, you try to, me, you, you carry out a linear combination of these G, Z, I's, and you try to minimize the distance between this linear combination and your input image X. What you do basically, you, you, if you have the manifold, with the gun 
generated images. And here you have your input X. You find the point in, in the gun manifold, which has the minimum distance with respect to X, but still lies in the gun manifold. So what happens? It happens that you are producing an image X hat that is close to the original and lives in the GAN manifold. And if the assumption that GANs can only produce images without perturbations, without adversarial perturbations, because the GAN has been trained on clean samples, then this X set will not contain the water, the, the attack. So if an image X come with the attack, I produce a clean X hat image without the perturbation is a kind of the noise. And then I feed the classifier with this X hat. This method works pretty well. Attacking this is difficult because this part, even if the attacker knows exactly this part, inverting this part and back propagating the output of the classifier to X through this part is difficult because this part is quite complicated. It is possible to do this. It has been done, but the attack comes out to be pretty complicated and not always effective. Why it is not perfect as a defense? Because the assumption that the output of domain of G does not contain adversarial examples is not completely true. Because uh, even if the GAN has been uh, trained on clean samples, there is no guarantee that taking a proper combination of the inputs will not produce uh, an image that contains some adversarial perturbation. But this is something that is very interesting meter, very clever, and uh, provides some, some more robustness against these attacks. OK, these are counter counter attacks. Another possibility is randomization. Here, I have to be careful. It's not the same randomization I talked to you before. Here, I'm not randomizing. Uh, this is wrong. Eh? Let me cancel this out. The main principle here is that I'm not trying to randomize the network. I am randomizing the input image. So I take an image, apply a rotation, apply a change in colors, I smooth the image, apply JPEG. So I randomize in, in a way that is not predictable by the attacker, the image before feeding it to the network. And the hope is that the adversarial attack which is implemented without considering this random transformation, because this random transformation is applied at test time. So it is absolutely impossible for the attacker to know it because it changes every time that the network is applied. It's not like before that I choose one classifier at random. Here, I'm randomizing the input. So, the attacker computes the adversarial example on the clean non-random inputs. And this may not work after that the input is modified. In fact, if we take the attack as is, the attacker that does not work. Uh, so this again is a good solution, but it can be again defeated if you apply something that we know already very well the expectation of a transformation minimization. If you assume that the attacker knows everything, the attacker cannot guess what kind of transformation will be applied at this time. But he knows 
the class of transformations apply the test time. And so you can compute the perturbation rho by minimizing the loss over an average of transformed image, where transformed images are T of I plus rho. This is what, what uh, was done uh, to enforce robustness against uh, digital to analog and analog to digital conversion. Well, it turns out that the transformation I'm applying are not those typical of the rebroadcast attack, but are those typical of uh, this randomization, then this defense can also be counterfeit. Of course, the attacker has to pay a price. This minimization is more complicated. It takes much more time to generate an attack image and the perturbation raw is larger. So I need to enforce a larger uh, perturbation. So even if this defense can be defeated, uh, there is an advantage. We made the life of the attacker more difficult. Uh, this is yet another possibility that we proposed in 2017. Once again, the idea is uh, adversarial training. But since uh, we cannot assume that we know the exact attack applied by the attacker, because here we are under the assumption that the attacker wins the knowledge battle, we retrain under what we called the most powerful attack. The idea is that if we could, we can't indeed, but if we could devise an attack, which is the most powerful ever, if I am able to resist this attack, I could resist also other kinds of attacks. And so consider this example here. The attacker wants to turn the green points into the blue region. The, the solid contour is the boundary of the original detector. Then I have this most powerful attack that brings the green point well, well, well inside the blue region. Suppose here, that will never be equal to the blue points. Otherwise, this means that a cat looks like a dog. And then, of course, we'll misclassify it. But close enough. If I retrain uh, my, my classifier to the dashed line, this is the new classifier, then uh, the blue dots will be closed, will be enclosed more carefully and attacking a classifier whose region is, is given by the dashed line is more difficult because this dashed line encloses more tightly the, the class I'm, I want to defend. Of course, this is not perfect because as I said, even this dashed line classifier can be attacked by adversarial examples. Still, attacking will require more power. The other problem is that this most powerful attack in practice may not even exist or there's no way that we can find it. But in this paper, we have applied this to to one particular case, and we saw some advantages of doing this. So in that, in that paper, we had a double JPEG detector, that is a system tried to detect double JPEG compressed images. And to try to find the most powerful attack. How, how did we do? We took our original uh, detector that at that time was based on SVM. 
because to rem we have to take into account that in 2017 or in that period, uh, the use of CNNs for multimedia forensic applications was still at the beginning. So if you look at papers before 2015, in forensics, they are all based on, multimedia, on, on classical machine learning. So in that period, we still use to attack SVMs and these things, but the same applies to CNN here. So we had this SVM meter trained on rich features. The feature proposed by Jessica Friedrich for stake analysis. And then what we did, we apply several kinds of attacks. So we applied the uh, is MPA, uh, no, this is wrong, I don't know. Anyhow, we applied the attack in 17, which is an attack proposed by STEM in 2010. We apply wavelength denoising, medium filtering, copy move. We applied uh, uh, local contrast enhancement, resizing with different interpolations, rotation, carving, blurring, mirroring, cropping, cropping, zooming. So we applied many. And we looked for the, which of these transformations resulted in the uh, lowest accuracy. So the one that was more harmful against the detector. And these are the two cases. So we said that uh, the attack in 17 by STEM and resizing with bilinear interpolation, no, bilinear cubic interpolation, were the most powerful attacks. Resizing with dithering. And then what we did, we retrained our classifier also with images attacked as in 17 and with big cubic resizing. And these are the new results we got. Of course, robustness against these two attacks improved a lot. And it was very small and now it improves. This is obvious because we tried to improve robustness against these two particular attacks. But if you look at the entire table, we got better results also on all the others. So for instance, here we had 070, 058, 072, 06, and here now we have 97, 92, 92, 99. So indeed, defending again the most powerful attack also improved, defend, also improved the capability to defend against other attacks. We still had not so good results against the resizing the rotation with the nearest neighbor approximation. So we fine tune also against near, nearest neighbor interpolation. And in the end, we were able to take good results also against these two, possibly losing a little bit against the others. But with these two retraining steps, we were able to find good results for an entire class of attacks without having to retrain on all the attacks together. This was an SVM, so adversarial examples did not exist in that case. Yet another possibility is to go back to old classical handcrafted features. The reason, and here I have an example. The reason is simple. Why are CNN easy to attack? Because of backpropagation. And backpropagation applies to both the fully convolutional layer and the, the fully connected layers and the convolutional layers. So here we have the convolutional layers, here you have the features, and here you have 
the fully convolutional layer. Here we have the input sample. But there's a reason to attack because we can back propagate the result to the input. Well, if we remove the fully convolutional layer and use as input to the, sorry, if you remove the convolutional layer and you feed the fully connected layers with the handcrafted features, that are computed from the input image, very often handcrafted features cannot be back propagated because they are based on things like edge extraction, uh, sift key point detection, histogram computation, and all these handcrafted features usually cannot be back propagated. So while it remains easy to carry out an attack in the feature space here. This is still easy. But going back in the pixel domain may be very difficult. So I say I can attack the histogram of an image, but producing an image with attack histogram can be difficult. Now, for the histogram, it's not so difficult, but in general, it can be difficult. So this is another attack, replace convolutional features with handcrafted features. We did so in this paper back in 2015, and the idea there was to replace convolutional features with higher order statistics. In particular here, we were using second order statistics. These are the so-called co-occurrence matrices. Don't care much about these pictures because they refer to the universal attack I described two days ago, don't care. The idea is that if I feed a network with these features, we did so in our in the recent papers of ours. If we feed the network with these features, then we can easily attack the network by implementing the attack in this domain. But once I have the attack, the concurrence matrix, matrix, finding an image which is close to the original image and whose concurrence matrix is the one we want is not easy. And concurrence matrix computation is something that cannot be back propagated because there is no gradient for that. And so this could be a good defense. In principle, it works very well. Is this perfect? No, it's not, but it can help. It is not perfect because what one could do is that you could, you, you could approximate the, the feature computation by means of a CNN. Handcrafted features are not invertible usually. They cannot be back, back propagated, but I can implement a differentiable back propagatable, if you want, CNN approximation of our features. For instance, in this paper in 2017, Cozzolino and Verdoliva proved that it is possible to re-implement local feature, local descriptors, for instance, also uh, these matrices, by using a CNN. It's not exactly equal, but it's a good approximation. And then attacking this instead of the network with the handcrafted features is pretty powerful. Nevertheless, 
the life of the attacker is more difficult now. Uh, now I have another topic here. So if you want to ask anything about the things we did so far, please don't be afraid to interrupt me when I have anything to ask. Good. Another possibility. Another possibility is to use one class classifiers. What is a one class classifier? Well, when I have two classes, like here, the red and the blue, and I want to distinguish the red and the blue, what we usually do is that we develop a detector for which the boundary and the detection regions are open regions. Everything on the left is blue, everything on the right is red. Even if I move very far on the right, and even if I move very far on the red, if I have a point here, this triangle, very likely, is not a blue, but it's not even a red. Because uh, maybe I want to classify cats and dogs. These are cats. These are dogs. What if I show to the network a horse? Maybe I mean, the network should decide between cat and dog. I give a horse, and maybe the network will say that this is a cat. If I give you a car, maybe a car is classified as a dog. Who knows? This could be a car. Well, and, and, and the reason for this is that with the two class classifier, the decision regions are open, unlimited. Sometimes you don't want to distinguish cats and dogs. You just want to recognize cats. So everything that is not a cat will be classified as a non-cat. In this case, if I give you a horse, the horse is a non-cat. If I give you a car, a car is a non-cat. If I give you a, an airplane, the airplane is not a cat. So if what I want to do is to only distinguish one class of objects, we have a so-called one class classifier. And in this case, you can already imagine that the boundary of the region I will obtain will be a closed boundary. Because I want to enclose as much as I can the set of the only class I know, dogs, for instance. Well, you can imagine that if this is the case, uh, modifying an image, so to make it look like a cat or a dog, it is, and suppose what I have said here are cats. If I want to modify an image, for instance, a dog or an airplane or a car, and I want to uh, make it look like a cat for the classifier, life is more difficult here. Because for instance, if I had this blue point here, in the two class classifier, I only need to travel this small step because there will be a point across the boundary that is not populated by cats, but that is classified as a cat, rather than going in the closest point in the one class classifier, because this is a cross set, and they really need to produce something which is similar to a cat. Cannot be something that doesn't look like a cat, doesn't look like a dog, but the network classifies this as a cat. Entering the one class is easy, is more difficult. Of course, exiting the class will be more difficult now. But if the goal of the attacker is to enter the closed class, then 
uh, attacking one class classifier is indeed more difficult. So if your application allows the use of one class classifiers, go for it because can be attacked, but is surely more difficult to attack. Yet another possibility that is uh, often mentioned is the use of ensemble classifiers. You could say, if I have several classifiers distinguishing cats and dogs, and I apply all of them, and then I fuse all the scores at any level to come out with the final decision, well, the first intuition is that attacking this kind of ensemble classifiers is more difficult. Because usually attacking only one classifier is not enough. Because suppose I use a majority rule and I want to classify a cat. If all the classifiers say cat and one of them has been fooled to say dog, then by majority rule, I will stay cat. Usually attacking only one of them is not enough to attack the entire ensemble classifier. Well, what I, could, what I could do, I mean, well, first of all, this is not necessarily the case eh? because it depends on the fusion rule. If you want to use an ensemble classifier, the fusion rule must be implemented very carefully. Otherwise, you may inherit the weaknesses of the classifiers rather than their strengths. We want that attacking the ensemble is as hard as attacking the worst, the most powerful classifier, not the weakest. But if you don't design well the fusion rule, you may end up also having a system where attacking the ensemble is easier than attacking the single classifiers. But if you design your fusion rule properly, then uh, it's okay. And then you can uh, uh, try to improve the security in this way. Even because the attacker cannot attack each single classifier by itself in an, iter in an iterative way. Because I can come out with an adversarial example for one. If then starting from this, try to come out with an adversarial example for two, it may be that this new adversarial example uh, does not work anymore for the classifier one. So iterating the attacks on all the classifiers usually does not work. So using ensemble classifiers could be another way to raise the bar against the attacker. Still, in the full knowledge case, it's not so obvious because uh, you could treat this as a black box, you have an output, you have an input. If this entire black box is back propagatable, if you can compute the gradient easily of the output with respect to the input, even if you have many classifiers, this doesn't mean anything. An adversarial attack may still exist. And in fact, this analysis is carried out uh, in this paper. I'll come back to this later. Nevertheless, again, the goal here is to raise the bar. And I have one example of this. And in this paper, 2020, we developed what is called a one and a half classifier, which is a particular example of ensemble classifier that tries to get the advantages of both one class and two class classifiers. 
There is the formula. I have, I mean, I have a sample at the input and I extract some features. If as in the implementation that we did, these are classical SVM like classifiers. If these are implemented by means of CNNs, then the feature extraction is optional and you can feed directly the classifiers with your image. Then what we do, we train one, two class classifiers, trying to distinguish original and manipulated images. Remember, here we deal about multimedia forensics. Then you also build a one class classifier for pristine non-manipulated images. And then we build one class classifier for manipulated images. Then we take the three outputs and input them in a final one class classifier for pristine images only. Altogether, we have a one class classifier for pristine images. So everything that it is outside the one class is supposed to be manipulated. So let me try to give a pictorial example of what we are doing here. So here we have, okay, no, let's go. Ah. I have to cancel everything again. So well, suppose you have some red points. These, I suppose you have some blue points. The two class classifier will come out with, with the decision boundary, which is uh, like this. The problem is that this is an open boundary and we don't like it. If I have a one class classifier for the blue, the, the one class classifier does not see the red. And so it will come out with something like this. It is a closed set, but it has some red points inside. If I design a one class classifier for the reds, I come out with this. So it's too bad. Which is a closed set around the reds, but they have some blue inside. While what I would like to come out with could be this one, if blue are the pristine. A one class circling and packing well together the blue and only the blue. Okay, okay here I had the same example, sorry. <laughs> so this is the two class, you see, have a good classification, but there are empty regions. So this red can be attacked easily. because you have empty regions. Here you have something that surrounds the blues, but you cannot get rid of this red in the middle. While with one and a half, what you wanna do is something that surrounds the blue and only the blue in a real close set. So that now attacking the green, the, 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 the red triangle is more difficult. If you want to attack this, now I have to travel a long way. But at the beginning, I could simply go here. So the idea is that this should retain the group properties of one and two class classifiers. And in particular, the good discrimination capabilities of the two class, because the two class is better in discrimination because you see examples of the two classes. But 
the close bound of the one class, which is better for security. We implemented this, trying to detect uh, adaptive histogram, histogram equalization or resizing or medium filtering. Uh, we did everything on the RISE data set and we implemented this with an SVM trained on spam features. Spam features are something like 1,000 features. This is what we get for the two class classifiers. The red are manipulated. In this particular case, it is a resizing. So the red are resized and the blue are pristine. They can be distinguished pretty well, but the pristine are scattered. Here you have the one class classifiers for manipulated and for, not sorry, for pristine and for resized. The one class, class classifiers are good because they have a close boundary, but you see that class, classification accuracy here is pretty bad. But when you put together, the result of one, two, and three, and the train another one class classifier, we have a very good discrimination capability. You can distinguish very well between the red and the blue. Both of them are not spread at all. And the boundary of the pristine region is bounded. So if I have something that is not pristine, it is resized and I want to bring it within the pristine region, this is difficult to do. And this is the proof, if you want. Uh, here I have resizing, medium filtering, and local enhancement. We try to attack the two class classifier and the combined one and a half classifier. We didn't try to attack the one class classifiers in the middle because they are difficult to attack. They are close set and they are difficult to attack. And then what? We were able to attack both of them. As I said, this is uh, an attack with full knowledge. It's difficult to attack them, but if I look at the mean square error of the attack, the amount of distortion I need to introduce in the one and a half classifier case, if I look at this, you see that this distortion is much larger, almost twice, almost twice, almost three times, that, that I would need to attack the two class classifier. Here I measure the strength of the attack, the amount of perturbation in terms of mean square error. Here below, I simply count the number of pixels I have to modify. And even in this case, the number of pixels I have to modify when I attack the combined detectors increases quite a bit, almost double. So again, the same story, even this attack even this defense is not perfect, but it raises the bar for the attack. In general, if we go back to what I said yesterday, the universal existence of adversarial examples applies to ensemble classifiers as well. And what I said yesterday is very general. I don't care about how I build the classifier. If these classifiers can be back propagated, for instance, uh, no way. These examples still exist. Maybe it is more difficult to attack, but still can be attacked. And indeed there is this paper published at Usenix five years ago that uh, uh, study the robustness of uh, ensemble defenses and if you put together several weak defenses, you don't get a strong defense. It improves a little bit 
but not much. Once again. So this is an overview. So uh, Professor Barney, uh, then we can infer that in symbol may not have that, okay, for uh, maybe may not be guaranteed that to be a good defense no, for attack. No, it, it's not, I mean, as I said, they are more difficult to attack, meaning that you need ad hoc measures. You need to know how the ensemble is done, but then you can attack it. You can, but it is okay, up, up to some extent, it is safer to defend up to certain or no. Some minimum, uh, can we say? No, 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 yes, there, there is some defense. I mean, it's yes. more difficult to attack it because, I mean, if you take one attack in the full box package as it is, Okay. And try to and try to attack this. It will not work. You need to okay. devise your own attack. That is, okay. is especially thought to work against the ensemble. Okay. And because you still have to remember that here you are considering the full knowledge case. The attacker knows everything, and it exploits this knowledge. Okay. Yes. If you try to use off the shelf attacker, they will not work. So, I mean, what I could say, if you have a system and you, and you want to protect it, it's better to use an ensemble classifier than nothing. Uh, yes. But you cannot claim that your system is a bullet proof. Bullet proof, yes. Okay, that's fine. Now, if, if, if I summarize everything, you will see that knowledge is everything. If the attacker knows everything and plays second, mm, he's gonna win likely. But we've also seen that if the defender plays second, very likely he's gonna win. So when I say that knowledge is a weapon, for who? It's a weapon for both. If I could know what the attacker knows, what the attacker does, I would win. And if the attacker knew what the defendant, what the defense is, the attacker would win. So what? Either we enter a classical attack and defense loop, or maybe we will sort to game theory. There's no other way. Because the classical attack and defense is that I analyze a classifier and attack this classifier. Then I analyze the attack and design a defense, but then I design the defense and attack the defense, come out with the new defense and so on and so forth. And there's no evidence that this will ever converge to the benefit of one of the two. And at least as far as I know, there has never been a paper showing that if I go on, for instance, with adversarial attack, adversarial retraining, Reattack, re-adversarial retraining, re-attack, retrain again. Of course, nobody have, has ever carried out this loop for thousands of iterations because it is too time consuming. Training networks takes days. So, I mean, nobody ever applied this for 1000 iterations and to take uh, years to do that. So we don't know, but all the attempts that I've seen running these uh, iterations for 10, 20, 30 loops never converge to something that is more attackable or an attack that is a universal one. So this is how things are. How can you exit the loop? Uh, one possibility is to use a worst case assumption. I can say, well, I don't care. I leave the last step to my enemy. I am a defender and I leave the enemy have the last word. I will try to defend under the assumption that the enemy knows everything. This is surely a sound strategy because I mean, I don't know anything, I prepare for the worst. Still, it may be too pessimistic. It, 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 I may reach the conclusion 
that the attacker always wins, or I can implement two heavy defenses, assuming that the attacker is omniscient. So the only other way to exit this is to use game theory when it is possible, because using game theory is not always easy uh, to come out with a with with uh, with good analysis, but there's no other way. Either we, we go on with a loop, and who knows what, or we apply a worst case assumption, trying to defend against the worst possible situation, or we try to apply game theory that is the most sound way, but I mean, it's not always easy to implement. So once again, adversarial machine learning game theory could be again a perfect fit. Even if, I mean, putting all the ideas that I have described today and yesterday in the game theoretic setting uh, is not easy. Very likely you, you will end up with something very theoretical as the things I, I, I said on, on Tuesday. Nevertheless, this is how the situation is at this moment. Uh, since I still have some minutes, I have a team, another example, because I came out with this yesterday, so I thought this could be interesting to you. I have another example where game theory was used to analyze this interaction between the attacker and the defender. It's one particular case. It deals with steganized and steganography, so it's not multimedia forensics, but there are CNNs and adversarial examples in the middle. And uh, it shows that indeed, we can use game theory to analyze the game, but if we want this analysis to be feasible, we have to make uh, strong assumptions on the strategies available to the two parties. Otherwise, the game comes out to be too difficult to be analyzed. But if you can restrict the analysis to some specific uh, narrow set of strategies, choices, then uh, use game theory can be a solution. And we published this just two years ago. So how could we apply this to, to steganography and steganizers? This girl is the steganographer. He's the receiver, but we don't care about it. The idea is that this girl must choose a steganalyzer and set the parameters of the steganalyzer, of the steganograph, of the steganography. So you can assume that this steganographic scheme has some parameters inside that you have to choose. You may want to choose knowing what the steganalyst, steganalyzer does. But skip it for one moment. Let us go to the steganalyzer. The steganalyzer has a detector. And again, this, de this detector has a number of parameters. And the steganalyzer wants to choose the parameters that are better suited to steganalyze the steganographic scheme chosen by the girl. But this steganographic scheme can have several set of parameters, A, B, C, D, which is the parameter chosen here. So the steganalyzer should choose the parameters of the steganalyzer, but with the, uh, with the guess on the parameters that the steganographer used. At the same time, the steganographer may want to choose the parameters of these steganographic tools, knowing which parameters give the best security against the steganalyzer. But he does not know the setting used by the steganalyzer that is chosen here. So you see, I have a choice to make 
the other has a choice to make, but the choice should be optimized knowing the choice of the other. And this uh, is a typical game theory setup. If we can describe in a simple way this set of parameters and this set of parameters, then we can run the game at least experimentally. What we can do is that we can build a big table where here, let me see what I have in the table. I don't have the tables here, I'm sorry for that. We can build a big table where here I have the, the girl, it's the girl, this is the man, and the man chooses his parameters, it can be one, two, three, ten. The girl can choose her parameters. They can be A, B, C, Z. And then what can we do? We can run simulations. So suppose that uh, then we have to define the payoff. Suppose the payoff is the error probability. The error probability of the stagnalizer. We fix the payload. Or maybe the payload could be one of these parameters. So suppose that the payoff is the error probability. The stagnalizer wants to decrease it. The error probability of the stagnalizer. And the stagnographer wants to increase it. Now, what we could do, we could run many, many, many simulations and compute by simulations the error probability for all possible combinations of A, B, C, Z, and one, two, three, four, ten. And then we will have this huge table. So for instance, we would have, I don't know, could have, I don't know, the, this is zero. Oh. This could be, 0, 2, this could be 0, 1, this could be 0, 3, this could be 0, 2, this 0, 4, 0, 3. You have these huge tables, and these numbers give the error probabilities obtained experimentally. Then, with this table in mind, we can find the equilibrium point of the game. And suppose the equilibrium point is this. Mm. If this zero three is the equilibrium point, then depends on the kind of equilibrium. Could be a Nash equilibrium, a dominance-based equilibrium, could be anything. And then we could decide to play this particular choice and the other can decide to play this particular choice if the equilibrium is strong enough. And this could be a way to analyze uh, in a game theoretic set, a situation where the number of strategies is small enough, because of course, if the number of rows is huge and the number of columns is, I don't know, huge again, then uh, this is impractical. And there's no way that you, can, that you can implement it. We did so in this paper, and we'll show some results. We use one particular steganographic scheme, one the, the, the developed by me and other colleagues in China and published in 2019. And there is one parameter beta in this uh, system, because basically, I mean, I will tell you this in a few words. Uh, we split the number of pixels in the image in two sets. In one of the sets, because there is this, uh, so there is, a steganographer, and the steganalyzer. The steganalyzer is based on CNN. 
So the steganographer takes an image and split the number of pixels into parts. Part of them, part of them are trained as usual, are used to embed the message with a conventional steganographic scheme. Eh? It's conventional. Then we assume that there is a steganalyzer trained on the conventional steganographer. And then we apply adversarial attack to this steganographic scheme. And here we have a steganography based on adversarial example. Built based on the signalizer. But we don't know how the signalizer is built exactly. The signalizer works, is trained on example of stego images. Good? Well, a parameter here is beta. Beta tells you the fraction of pixel for which the steganography is carried out by attacking the steganalyzer. If beta is one, all the pixels are trained attacking the steganalyzer. If beta is zero, everything is carried out by using the conventional stego image. The steganalyzer on his hands take images generated in this way and it is straight. So the steganographer must decide beta. So it's the beta of the steganographer. How do we call it? Uh, the, adver the adversary here is... Uh, Who's the adversary in this setting? I don't know, say one of them. I call the steganographer the adversary. So this is beta chosen by the steganographer. But then the steganalyzer must be trained on stego images. And to produce the stego images, I had to apply the steganography, the steganographic algorithm, but I don't know the beta used by the steganographer. So the, steganal the steganalyzers will be trained by using the beta, which is beta D, because the steganalyzer does not know the beta A used by steganographer. And the steganographer must choose the beta A without knowing what kind of beta will use the signalizer. Good. And then the game is played by letting beta define the space of strategies, quantize values of betas. So beta can be equal to 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1. And the payoff is given by the error probability. We, we could build, I mean, I didn't report here, but it would, it would have been nice. We built huge tables providing, we run many, many simulations and built huge tables with all the beta A's and all the beta D. And for each combination, we carried out many experiments and estimated the error probability. And then we wanted to find an equilibrium or maybe a Nash equilibrium. And something, and something interesting happens here. In general, we found that if the stake analyzer uses a small value of beta, 
is better for the steganographer to use a big value so that the steganalyzer is mismatched with the steganographic scheme. At the same time, if the steganalyzer uses large values of beta for the steganographer, it's better to use small values of beta. So to again, enforce a mismatch. Well, for the steganalyzer, quite obviously, it would be preferable to play a matched B because the best thing is to train the steganalyzer based on the real beta used by the steganographer. But the steganographer does not know. You don't know what is this. So what? What do you do? You choose a small, you choose a large beta. Well, you look for the equilibrium point based on the exact numbers in the table. It comes out that a Nash equilibrium does not exist. In fact, we know in game theory that there is no guarantee that the Nash equilibrium exists. Or in some cases, there may be more than one Nash equilibrium. So the interpretation of the results of the game depends and may be different from case to case. But what we know from game theory is that a Nash equilibrium always exists for mixed strategies. I didn't talk about this on Monday. What is a mixed strategy? Once I have this table, I could decide if I play the game several times, I could decide to choose my strategies according to a certain probability. I could choose, I don't know, strategy one with probability zero one, strategy two with probability zero three, strategy n with probability zero, zero five. And the other player can do the same. So now the strategy is not a pure choice of one strategy. But my mixed strategy is a probability distribution over the available strategies. And these kind of strategies are called mixed strategy because I do not always play the same value. I change with a certain probability. Well, it can be proven that a Nash equilibrium always exists if you consider mixed strategies. So in this particular game here, these observations lead to a situation where typically a Nash equilibrium does not exist. But this equilibrium exists in mixed strategies and this is what we get. Beta A is the steganographer and D is the steganalyzer. These are quantized values of beta uh, with step 005. It turns out that the best thing to do for the steganographer is to choose, choose small values of beta, but from time to time, choose a big value. Because always choosing a small value gives an advantage to the steganalyzer. It's good to shift from time to time from small values to large values. Yet the preference is given to small values because even if I have a matched steganalyzer, the error probability is larger for small values of beta. For the steganographer, sorry, for the steganalyzer, the best is to use almost always small values of beta, but not zero. So that uh, there may be some mismatch 
with what the attacker does, but the mismatch is not that big. And from time to time, play an intermediate value of beta that uh, can take into account what happens both with large value and small value. So you see, the game theory, maybe an equilibrium point does not exist, but at least a mixed equilibrium, a mixed strategy equilibrium exists. And this will tell you with which probability you should play one uh, strategy or another. So, so many, this? Professor Bernie, please, please. so many sequence that stenographer can choose many. This probability distribution may be defined in many ways. Uh, of course, the steganographer can decide many distributions, but then there is one which is optimal. And it is the equilibrium in mixed strategy. So, okay, so, okay. So, I mean, in this case, you play a game at a different level. The choice of the steganographer, I mean, the choice of one of the two is any possible distribution of probabilities. Okay. And the choice of the other is again every possible distribution. And you okay. find an equilibrium when you play the distributions. Well, it can be shown, this is a famous result. If it's a famous result in game theory. You can show that in this setting, when you use probabilities, an equilibrium point always exists. Good. And uh, it is what it is. Does this answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay, good. So this is what you got. And then we have the payoff. You can compute the payoff when these two plays at, at, this, uh, at this point. What matters here for what I said is this second one. And it comes out that if you play with, this prob with these probabilities, the error probability will be 30.8%, uh, 0 0.3. I mean, doesn't say much. But... Uh, that's all. Huh? So I, I wanted to introduce this as an additional example of how you could use game theory in practice. Restrict, I mean, rather than trying to be as general, rather than try to be as general as possible as I did on Monday and Tuesday, in which case you get very general results, but very theoretical. At this other extreme, you can take a particular situation, restrict the kind of choices you want to analyze, quantize them, run experiments, and then solve the game on experimental data. This is not very general because this applies only to these two particular steganographic algorithms and these two particular steganalyzer when the game is played on this particular parameter beta. So this is on the other extreme. It's not general at all. It's very, very, very specific. But still, you can apply game theory even in this very, very specific case. In some cases, it's simply not possible. And then you have to apply some heuristics or apply worst case attack or whatever. So in general, in summary, I will say again the same things. Devising defenses and the strong threat models, in particular in a white box, full knowledge setting is extremely difficult. But may not be necessary because uh, assume that, that, that the adversary knows everything may be a too pessimistic assumption. In fact, the situation may not be so bad because first of all, the attacker may not be so powerful and we saw yesterday that the attacker has its own problem to solve, to implement real world attacks. That's all. And with this, I finish my overview of uh, adversarial examples and attacks 
and defend this and defenses in the framework of adversarial examples. Tomorrow, different topic, backdoor attacks, attacks at training time, completely different things, and uh, very interesting also, I think. Yeah, I think we'll open up for question and answers, Q&A, if somebody wants to ask more. Uh... I think it is the floor is open. You can also use the chat box if that is okay. Yeah, I think it's fair enough. Uh, so we'd like to thank Professor Bernie for, uh, if we summarize for today, it, it was a session on defenses. Uh, some part of the attacks was uh, was taken and later it was focused on defenses and as in the summary it is written it's really extremely difficult but it is still possible so that opens up uh, a general phrase that there is no bad war or there is no good peace so uh, <laughs> yeah so 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 we we'll, we we'll look at this particular problem so we also had a diverse area outside forensics where a steg analysis and stegnographer thing was modeled in a game theoretical framework and also possibility so again it is broadly imaging field where a stego is present so even i had a lot of questions here and there so it's a it's a big field i know that it's difficult to finish it in 5 days but still but still it is a, a, like a great effort that we had it's 3 and a half hours almost he is continuously going so i think it's time for him for break for lunch and also time for us for our tea time in india so mm -hmm. i think uh, tomorrow would be the last date so i just want to remind the participants morning session we'll be showing some examples so in fact there was a perfect uh, uh, sort of hand in hand because professor bernie today told about ensemble classifiers and we had done ensemble just yesterday with an uh, uh, simplified data set like an iris but still it was uh, it, like it was more useful here where uh, it was being told how the classifier the fusion rule so we had done voting and all that stuff in our collab notebooks so that was from morning it will be gans so the focus would be on gans and again later in the evening tomorrow please note that it would be an evening session for us in india because professor bernie would be joining in the afternoon so i think with this we'll end it professor bernie so thank you and namaste again from our side so we'll see you a last time tomorrow as part of the workshop and again look forward we could again uh, interact as we know tomorrow's session would be backdoor attacks and benign attacks so that uh, like that kind of thing and i think that is a new thing when we had designed the course the last days was something different and uh, yeah and this last day was changed on the when we were again finalizing it last month because professor varni said that he will try to bring more things which are newer this because this particular course as we know was sanctioned in 2019 2020 when we wrote the proposal but after that there has been because research won't stop it's a continuous game right it's in a game theoretic framework that's so true. that's how it is so 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 it is he has changed the last day so we also even i am not aware many things about this p9 attacks backdoor attacks we'd like to look into that so we eagerly await your presence tomorrow dr subarni so thank you very much namaste again okay. namaste bye 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 see you tomorrow